praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, today we're going to reflect upon a very important theme that the Bible teaches us. As we all know that we are in the season of Lent. And there is this passage in the Bible that comes to us again and again in every Lenten season. Let us look at this picture. And this picture will depict the main theme of the Lenten season. We find in the gospel that Jesus is confronting the devil when he was in the desert, when he was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So in remembrance of what, it, what Jesus did in the desert, we are observing Lenten season. We are fasting, we are in prayer. And there is one thing that Jesus did in the desert, and that is he confronted the devil. Let us understand this important thing that Jesus is teaching us. Jesus is not just refusing to acknowledge the devil. Jesus is not acting as if devil is not there. Instead, Jesus is acknowledging that the devil is coming to him. Jesus is not keeping quiet when the devil is coming with temptations. Jesus did not say that I will not get into conflict and therefore better I keep quiet. We read that Jesus is having a face off with the devil. He is confronting the devil. He's speaking to him. And there is a conflict that is taking place between Jesus and the devil. My dear brothers and sisters, now this is what we need to learn from the life of Jesus. There are times in our life when we have to confront. There are times in our life when we cannot just wish and we cannot just pray that a difficult situation or a difficult person just goes away from our life. We cannot just take a, a diplomatic approach always in our life. There are times when we don't want to hurt anyone or we don't want to annoy anyone. We don't want to be in the bad books of someone and therefore we try to take a diplomatic strategy. We try to bypass that person whom we need to confront. Or we, we just overlook a difficult situation that we are facing. Or maybe we are just trying to convince ourselves that there is no problem in our life. Or I just have to turn a blind eye to this thing. And after some time, this difficult thing will automatically go away. Now, the scripture is teaching us this Lenten season is teaching us in a very explicit way that there are times in our life when you cannot just sit and pray and wish that a difficult situation will automatically disappear from your life. You have to get into action. You have to go and confront a difficult situation that you are facing in your life today. You have to confront the devil or you have to have a face off with that person who is creating a difficult situation in your life. You cannot always keep quiet just to have peace in your life. Just to have peace in your family, you might be thinking that, that the more we get into conflict, the more we are losing our peace. So better that I keep quiet always so that there will be peace in our family. Now that is a wrong strategy. Bible is not teaching us, same way Jesus is not teaching us, that you have to be always keeping quiet. Jesus has taught us the lessons of love, the lessons of compassion, the lessons of mercy. But at the same time, Jesus is also teaching us that there are times in your life when you have to spring into action, when you have to open your mouth, when you have to point out the problem, and when you have to confront the opposition in a bold way. So that is what we're going to spend time today and think about more in a detailed way, what is it that the scripture is teaching us more in this line? Now, we might be saying that we are already confronting people in our life. 
or we are already confronting situations in our life but are confronting the people or situations in our life the situation is becoming worse or it is getting deteriorated why i am not experiencing peace even after confronting that man or that woman or even after confronting a situation why i am not able to experience peace and joy in my life so there are these questions that we are going to spend time with and we're going to think in the light of the word of god so the first thing is this my dear brothers and sisters that we need to acknowledge that there is a problem that we are facing in life or there is a difficult situation i am facing in my life or there is a sin with which i am struggling in with my life or there is a person who is making my life difficult i need to acknowledge that at the very outset i cannot just say this man or this woman is not a problem for me or this sin is not a problem for me or this situation is not a problem for me first of all let us get rid of that strategy what is a problem let's name it that is really a problem in my life jesus did not just keep quiet when the devil was there trying to tempt him jesus did not act as if devil is not existing jesus is speaking and jesus is resolving that problem so my dear brothers and sisters first of all we need to identify the problem and we need to spell the problem and we need to acknowledge that there is a difficult situation in my life there is a story which is often uh, told to the children it is so rich in meaning therefore let us go once again maybe you have heard the story when you were a child but let's refresh our memory and let us see what is the story actually trying to tell us so it's about a boy called billy billy bixby is a boy when he got up one day in the morning he noticed that there is a dragon sitting on his bed a very small dragon the size of a kitten billy was excited and so what billy did billy went and patted the dragon and with his excitement he is going to his mom and telling the mom with so much of enthusiasm that i have seen a dragon in my room but the mom who was busy with her work she said that billy there is no such thing as dragon what you are saying is something very stupid it is something ridiculous there is nothing a uh, such thing called dragon and then the mother is sending him away so billy comes back to his room and he starts dressing up the dragon is coming close to billy so that he gets patted again so that he gets noticed again but billy this time is not patting the dragon billy is not giving any attention to the dragon because his mother said there is no such thing as dragon so it would be silly to pat something which is not existing so billy is not even giving any attention to this small dragon that is trying to come and be there with billy now what happens billy goes for the breakfast he's sitting on the breakfast table the mother is coming with a fresh breakfast and serving billy but now the dragon is also sitting on the table this time mother is able to see the dragon but mother cannot say anything mother cannot just get rid of the dragon mother cannot just push off the dragon from the table why because mother herself said there is no such thing as dragon so now mother is taking this strategy as if dragon is not existing there and so she comes and she serves billy the breakfast but what happens the dragon starts eating all the breakfast that is served to billy billy is not getting any bread or the dishes that the mother has prepared the dragon ate all the breakfast and slowly and gradually now what happens 
the dragon is becoming bigger. After having a heavy breakfast, now the dragon is dozing off. Dragon has, has gone for a nap. And the dragon is there on the hallway. Mother is seeing the dragon. But yet, mother does not do anything to take away the dragon. Why? Because according to her, there is no such thing as dragon. She thought maybe she is just hallucinating. But she is refusing to acknowledge the fact that there is a dragon in the house. And then what happens? The story tells us that as day goes by, the dragon is becoming bigger and bigger. It is increasing in size. And because of which, the mother finds extremely difficult to clean the house. It is taking way more time to clean the house because dragon is occupying all the space in the house. Even Billy is finding it difficult to come to mother because everywhere the dragon is filling the house. So when Billy ultimately came to mom, Billy said, I didn't know dragons grew so fast. But again, the mother said firmly, there is no such thing as a dragon. And then what happened? By noon, the dragon filled the house. Its head hung out of the front door. Its tail hung out of the back door. And there wasn't a room in the house that did not have some part of the dragon in it. So now, practically, the house is resting on the dragon. In the evening, what happens? In the evening, when dragon woke up, he found that he was very hungry. And there was a bakery truck which was going by. The smell of fresh bread was more than the dragon could resist. So the dragon ran down the street after the bakery truck. The house went along, of course, like the shell on a snail. And then what happens when Mr. Bixby, that is the head of the family, when he comes to house after his office time, he notices that the house has just gone. The house has disappeared from the place. Luckily, there was a neighbor who told Bixby what really happened. And then the conclusion of the story is this. Finally, the mother is acknowledging that there was a dragon. And it was the dragon that has been causing all the havoc in the house. The moment the mother acknowledged that there was a dragon, the story tells the dragon again became very small in size. And then the conclusion, mother says, why did it have to grow so big? Billy said, I'm not sure, but I think it just wanted to be noticed. My dear brothers and sisters, now this is a very small story, children's story, and often we may not give any attention to the story. What is it that can teach us? But there is this important lesson that we can pick out from this story. There is a problem happening in the house. Or there is a difficult situation which is occurring in the house. But the mother is refusing to acknowledge that there is a problem. And then the lesson that we get is this. The more we refuse to acknowledge, the more the problem becomes bigger. The problem will not go away just by turning a blind eye, just by overlooking or just by bypassing that problem, the problem is not going to disappear. The problem will deteriorate, it will become bigger. Now this could be happening in our life also. We are failing to confront a situation. Let's take an example of a sin with which we are struggling. Maybe we have the habit of drinking alcohol. But we are not acknowledging that we are alcoholic. We are not acknowledging that I am drinking alcohol or I am addicted to alcohol. Maybe we are trying to defend ourselves and justifying ourselves that I'm just taking alcohol occasionally. I'm not an addict. See what is happening. You are not acknowledging the problem. Or maybe you are smoking. You are addicted to smoking. But you are not acknowledging that you have become an addict. You might be saying that I'm just smoking only sometimes. Maybe when I'm in tension, 
or when I get worried, that's the only time that I am smoking. But the reality is this, there is a problem in your life which you do not wish to confront. Or it could be a lustful desire, maybe a sin of lust with which you are struggling. Maybe you are addicted to pornography or maybe entertaining sexual desires, but you are not ready to acknowledge that you have become an addict to lustful desires. You might be saying that it's only sometimes that I watch pornography or it's only sometimes that I entertain lustful desires. But the fact could be, or the reality could be, my mind is filled with lustful desires. So see, the one thing that we are doing in our life is very wrong. The first thing is this, we are not willing to acknowledge the problem in our life. We know what happened in the scripture with Samson. Samson was dealing with a lustful problem. But he was not willing to face off with this problem. He was meddling with this and he was trying to be playful. He was trying to overlook this problem or maybe he was trying to just neglect this thing. He was trying to convince himself that he can just overcome this problem anytime. But what happened? Slowly and gradually, that problem was becoming bigger and bigger. And ultimately what happened? This small problem, which was initially very small in size, later what happened? This small problem became bigger and bigger and finally it became the cause of the downfall of Samson. So that's how it goes in our life also. A small sin which we are trying to neglect or which we are trying to ignore, but the more and more we are ignoring it, the more and more it is becoming bigger. And the more and more we are heading towards destruction. Let's take the case of Judas. Now Judas went and sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The Bible is teaching us that this did not happen all of a sudden. Slowly and gradually, there was a problem in the life of Judas that was becoming bigger and bigger all the time. We read in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 12, verse 6, the Word of God says, Judas kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. So the Word of God is teaching us that the common purse was with Judas and he was having the habit of stealing the money that was falling into that common purse. You see, he did not confront that problem. He did not deal with that problem. Maybe he thought that, that any time I can overcome this problem of greed. But what happened? It was this problem that became bigger and finally it brought the downfall of Judas. My dear brothers and sisters, so the first thing that we need to be taking care of is this, that I have to acknowledge or I have to be aware, I have to be conscious that there is a problem that I'm facing in my life. Or it could be in my family. It could be in our relationships. Maybe you are having a problem with your husband or with your wife or with your children, with your, with your uh, brothers and sisters. But you are trying to remain quiet. Thinking that if I remain quiet, after some time, the problem will disappear. But it is not going to disappear. You have already seen something wrong happening in your family or something bad that is taking place with your husband or with your wife, your children or your brothers and sisters, but you are not voicing. You are just keeping quiet. You are just saying that I will pray and pray and the problem will go away. I don't have to act in any way. Now that is not a good strategy because Jesus himself is teaching us there has to be prayer and there has to be action. Now, in that same line, the Catholic Church teaches us that we are called to be like Jesus. Let me draw your attention to one of the important teachings of the Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1267 and 1268. It says, Baptism makes us members of the body of Christ. To be a holy priesthood, by baptism, 
their share in the priesthood of Christ, in his prophetic and royal mission. They are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. That's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us. So when we read the Bible, we see that Jesus is having three offices. He is fulfilling three roles. The role of a prophet, the role of a priest, and the role of a king. So Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophets that we come across in the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the priests that we come across in the Old Testament. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all the kings that we come across in the Old Testament. So these three important roles that Jesus fulfilled during his lifetime. And now the Catholic Church teaches us, just like Jesus, because we all are called to imitate Jesus. We all are called to follow the footsteps of Jesus. So same way, we have got three roles to perform in our life. We are priests, we are kings, and we are prophets. So let's focus on this one office of Jesus today, and that is the prophetic mission of Jesus. We already read three missions that Jesus fulfilled. The prophetic mission, the royal mission, and the priestly mission. So today, let us think how or what was it, how was it that Jesus fulfilled the prophetic mission? So we have a misunderstanding today about prophets or about the prophetic mission. Today, there are people who say that they have got gifts of prophecy. So when they are asked, what do you mean by gift of prophecy? They say, well, the Lord is giving me some messages about some healings taking place. Or the Lord is giving me some messages about future. So that's the popular understanding of prophecy today. And when you go to the YouTube, you will find there are so many prophets who are prophesying about future or who are prophesying many things about the things that are about to happen. Now, let us understand, in the light of the Bible, or according to the Word of God, prophets were not sent primarily to tell the future, to predict things. That was not the primary work of the prophets. God is sending prophets from time to time. God is sending prophets, and there is a reason behind that. Why there was a need for God to send prophets into the land of Israel? Well, the Bible says, prophets came up when there was something bad taking place. When there was a problem in the land of Israel, it was during that time that God was sending a prophet. In other words, the primary objective of the prophet was to indicate or to point out to the people of Israel that there is something wrong happening here. There is something evil taking place here. Or this is a sin with which you are struggling. That was the primary purpose of sending prophets to the land of Israel. If there was no sin, or if there was no disobedience, God does not have the need of sending a prophet. Let's understand this. God is not sending a prophet first and foremost to tell the future. Or first and foremost to, to tell that there is something going to happen. It's not the primary focus of sending a prophet. You see, Jesus came into this world. Why did Jesus came into this world? He did not come to tell us the future. So some people come for the retreat. And all they are focused upon is they want to know about the future. If people go for counseling, their only purpose is to know about the future. Well, let's understand, Jesus did not come into this world to tell us what future is holding for us. Or how is it going to take place? You see, there are times when the disciples of Jesus asking him, when are the end times going to come? And Jesus is not giving them a very clear answer. Why? Because that's not the primary uh, objective of Jesus. Jesus came in order to tell us 
that there is something wrong happening. You have to repent. You have to give up your evil ways. If you have to enter into the eternal kingdom, you have to give up your sinful ways. Well, that was the primary mission of Jesus. So my dear brothers and sisters, let us not be carried away or let us not just have a misinterpretation of the word prophet. Prophet does not primarily mean to tell about the future or to predict about the future. Prophet means a man or a woman who is sent by the Lord in order to point out that there is something bad or there is a problem. There is a difficult situation and we have to deal with it. So that is the mission of a prophet. So same way, Jesus fulfilled a prophetic mission. And therefore, you and I, we who have received baptism in the name of Jesus, we have received Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, and we have decided to follow Jesus in his footsteps. What does that mean? We have to be a prophet. That means I have to open my mouth, I have to indicate, I have to point out that there is a problem. I cannot just keep quiet. I cannot just remain silent and say that problem will go away on its own. No. I have to open my mouth and I have to speak. So let's take some examples from the Bible and we will understand more clearly. We read about King David. King David was confronted by a prophet named Nathan. Now why God is sending Nathan to David? Well, there is a reason. David is committing sins after sins. He is committing mortal sins after mortal sins. And he is not aware of it. He is not conscious of that thing. First of all, there is a lustful desire. He is entertaining that lustful desire. He goes and commits adultery. And then he is manipulating his office. Then he is killing the husband of that woman. There are so many bad things that David is doing. And he is not giving any attention to that. He's just turning a blind eye to this thing. So finally what God did, God is sending a prophet to David. Why? Not to tell the future of David. Not to predict what is going to happen with David. The primary mission of this prophet was to go and tell him that there is a problem in your life. There is a sin in your life. You have to repent on that sin. You have to give up that sin and turn back to the Lord. Well, that was the mission of prophet Nathan. So same way, we are prophets. We are sharing in the, in, the, in the prophetic mission of Jesus. That means I cannot just overlook or bypass or I cannot just pass over a problem in my family. You see, if today your relationship is on the rock, your husband, your wife, maybe there's so much of tension between, uh, between husband and wife. Or maybe you are on the verge of divorce. One of the reasons is this. You did not confront the problem at the appropriate time. Or maybe today your children are lost to you. They are addicted to sinful things or they, they, are, they are addicted to sinful objects, sinful habits. Maybe your children are taking drugs or alcohol or they are not listening to you. Why such a situation have come about? Because you did not confront your children at the very outset. You saw that that was a problem with your children, but you overlooked it. You thought that when they grow up, it will be all right. But the problem did not go away. The problem became bigger and bigger. You shied away from confronting your children, from confronting your husband, or you were, you were thinking that if I confront my wife or my brothers and sisters, they will be hurt or they will be wounded. And so you kept quiet. Now today what happened? Today that very situation has spiraled out of control. It's, it's gone out of proportion. Maybe today that situation is not in your hands. So my dear brothers and sisters, let us pray to the Lord for the courage, for the strength. And let us understand this. I cannot just pray and pray and pray and keep quiet. I have to pray and at the same time, I have to confront a difficult situation or a difficult person in my life. Now, the question that we first asked was this. 
Why is it that even after confronting my husband or my wife or my children or my friends or my relatives, why the situation is not improving? Why more conflicts happening? Or why we are fighting all the more? If confrontation is the solution to the problem, then why I'm not able to see the result? Now, there is a reason for that. And what is that reason? Let's see. Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 and 7. Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 and 7. It says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to tear and a time to sue, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. The word of God is saying that please don't go about saying that I have to confront people or I have to snap at people or I have to oppose people all the time. No, the word of God is saying there is a season for everything. There is a time for every matter under heaven. You have to be aware of that timing. You cannot just blurt out things out of time. There is a time. Only at that time when you confront, or only at that time when you speak out, only then there will be a result. Only then there will be conversion or repentance. Otherwise, what will happen? Otherwise, there will be more and more fights taking place in your family. Or there will be more and more conflicts taking place in your family without any resolution. So the word of God is teaching us that there is a time to keep silence. And there is a time to speak. So when there is a time, when it's time to, to keep silence, during that time if you are speaking, your situation will degenerate. And at the same time, when it is time to speak, you are keeping silent, again, your situation will deteriorate. So we must know when is the time to speak and when is the time to keep silence. We cannot take this strategy that I will, I will always keep silent. No, the word of God is saying there is a time to keep silence and there is a time to speak. So I have to be silent, I have to be speaking. The only thing is that I have to know the timing. And who will know the timing? Who will know the timing when it is time to keep silence or when it is time to speak? Well, only a person who is spending time with the Lord. Let's read the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 12, verse 12. Luke, chapter 12, verse 12. Jesus says, For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. Jesus is saying, it is the Holy Spirit who is going to give you the words. It is the Holy Spirit who will teach you what you ought to say. Without the Holy Spirit, if you are getting into confrontation, it is going to be a disaster. It's going to be a big tragedy if you speak what you want to speak. You are getting emotional. Or maybe you are getting riled up, you are disturbed, and you are speaking to that man or to that woman, or maybe to your brothers and sisters, without the Holy Spirit. Without the words that the Spirit has given to you, if you speak, the situation will not improve, it will become worse. So we need to understand this, that it is the Holy Spirit who will give us the word what we ought to speak. Let's read Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verse 26. Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verse 26. Again, Jesus says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Again, Jesus is putting that emphasis. Holy Spirit is the Advocate. You should not become your Advocate. We know the work of the Advocate. It is the advocate who speaks on our behalf. So if you go to the court case, it is the advocate who speaks for you. Now, if you are going to become the advocate, you're speaking on your own behalf, it's going to be a tragedy. 
It is the Holy Spirit who has to be your advocate. That means He is speaking on your behalf. He is giving the words that you ought to speak. And then what happens? He will teach you everything. At the appropriate moment, what is it that you need to speak? Or at the appropriate moment, how is it that you have to keep silent? It is the Holy Spirit who will teach you. When we are being led by the Holy Spirit, then the Word of God says, there will be a change. There will be the results of confrontation. Maybe after 20 years of your marriage, or 25 years of marriage, all these years you have been confronting your husband or your wife, and the situation is still the same, or maybe the situation has become all the more bad. Why? Because you are not speaking the word which the Spirit is giving. You are speaking your own words. So Pope Francis says that often we become impulsive and we just blurt out things driven by our impulses. Now that is not going to help us. If we really want to change a situation, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. So for that, we need to spend time with the Lord. Well, that's the first thing. I have to spend time with the Lord and only when the Lord is inspiring me, only when the Lord is giving me the words, I have to open my mouth and I have to speak. But at the same time, please understand this. Do not say that I will just keep praying and praying and praying and I don't have to open my mouth. Now, that is not the strategy of our Lord. The strategy of the Lord is there is time for prayer. You see, he, he went to the desert. And he is spending time in prayer. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he is going and confronting the devil. So being filled with the Holy Spirit, he is confronting the evil one. So same way, there is a time when we are spending with the Lord. And there is a time in our life when we have to confront situation. Let's again read what happened in the book of Jonah. You see, Jonah was the prophet. And Jonah was the prophet who was not willing to go. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. But Jonah does not want to go there. But again and again, God is persisting. And finally, through the whale, the Lord is sending Jonah to the shores of Nineveh. You see, again, there is this important aspect that the Bible is teaching us. Jonah is not going to Nineveh on his own accord. He is not going to Nineveh and speaking to the people because he wants to speak or because he is getting emotional. No, he is going to the shores and he is preaching the message of repentance to the people of Nineveh because he has been sent by the Lord. So if we are not seized by the Holy Spirit, if we are not taken control by the Holy Spirit, then all our efforts of confrontation will go in vain. We will waste our energy, we will waste our time, and we will waste all our efforts. Thanks so much for watching. If you are inspired by this video, I encourage you to share it. If you are interested to receive videos like this, please subscribe to Tabor Vision YouTube channel. And to receive notification, please press the bell icon button.